In this video, I'm going to try and use iTrain to uh, control and drive a, a locomotive around my model railway in Engage. How hard can that be? So I played around a bit with iTrain uh, before and also Train Controller. Um, but I want to try and get set up uh, so that my layout was working uh, properly with iTrain and see what it could do for me. Um, now I knew that the first thing I had to do was to try to connect it uh, to the system. Um, and I do that by going to interfaces here. Um, and I need to add my, um, my controller, um, which is Digitrax controller. So I'm looking for Digitrax and I can't find it. Um, uh, but uh, Digitrax uses LocoNet, so maybe it's LocoNet, but I can't find that either. So I'm a bit disappointed at this point. Um, and uh, the reason I'm a bit disappointed is that I need to uh, get a license key. Um, now, just to explain how uh, licensing for iTrain works, um, I believe you can use it without a license. Um, for a while, but it has uh, sort of limited functionality, and it has a, a, only a small number of trains um, and uh, and accessories that you can control, and so on. Um, so that works. That works if you're just going to sort of have a bit of a go. Um, but once you get to uh, wanting to set up a serious layout, you need a license. Um, you could also get a trial license, um, which gives you the features uh, uh, that aren't enabled to the unlicensed version. Um, but uh, obviously, trial license only lasts for a certain uh, amount of time. And in the end, I, I got a trial license um, and just sort of uh, managed to solve some of my problems um, before actually paying for uh, the version I've got. I, I can't remember which one I've got. Maybe the it's not the most expensive one, uh, but the next one up, I think. Next one down, I think. Anyway, having uh, having got myself a license, I then need to go and uh, just. Um, uh, Put the license in, uh, so you, it's licensed to an, an email address, and you get a big long magic number, um, big long license key, um, and uh, you need to pop that in, and uh, then your version is licensed. So that's all good. So if I uh, if I now try and connect up um, my controller. Um, and in fact, what I've, what I've done here is I've, I've already set up a uh, um, set up a bit of a layout uh, already. Um, so I open that. But if I if I go along to the interfaces now, um, and I should be able to show you that uh, I've got uh, there you go. I've got Digitrax uh, controller, and that is set up as LocoNet type. So that's what I need. I'm trying to find it. Um, now, the reason LocoNet wasn't there before I, I got the license um, is that LocoNet is uh, proprietary to Digitrax. Um, and so in order to write software for it, you need to pay uh, Digitrax, which is sort of another another reason not to go with Digitrax, I suppose. Um, I hate to say that. I hate to have to say that. Um, anyway, uh, need to uh, just play around with uh, some of the settings uh, in particular. Um, you set the serial port to be the one that your uh, um, uh, that your uh, USB to LocoNet um, sort of interface device is on, and uh, the one I'm using, oh, I forget what it's called now. But anyway, uh, it's a PR4, I think. Um, uh, it's Digitrax PR4 I'm using to connect, um, and in particular, um, that will set up a, a, a new serial port on your computer. So for me, it's COM port 4, and you can see the settings um, I've got there. In particular, I had to set uh, flow control to be RTS CTS in order to make it work. Um, that it makes sense that would be the case. 
Um, but uh, I had to fiddle around with that for a bit uh, just to set them up. And then uh, having uh, having done that, I can then connect um, connect to my layout. Okay, so uh, I've played around with iTrain a bit, um, and I've set a few things up. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just give you a quick sort of whistle stop tour uh, of the various screens, um, and then we'll try and have a bit of a fiddle and make some some things happen. Um, so most uh, most things seem to be on this uh, edit menu. Uh, we had a look at uh, interfaces, and that's where you set up uh, different controllers and um, sort of connections that you have between the computer and the layout. Um, so we've done that. Uh, there's boosters, so presumably if you've got uh, separate boosters, you know, separate from the controllers, uh, you can play around with that, but that doesn't affect me. Um, and then there's a few other things here. Um, there's feedbacks. Now we have feedback devices, and that's one of the things I'm interested in, so we'll come on to that. There's accessories, which means like points, signals, things like that, but let's just say it means points. Uh, so that's where we can set those up. And locomotives, um, you know, trains. Well, not trains, locomotives. Um, and I say, I say, not uh, not trains because it's a separate thing, which is trains in particular. Um, so I think in in I train, a train is you know like a load of coaches or a load of wagons, and a locomotive on the front, and that's different to the locomotive. Um, but uh, we're not worried about trains for the moment. Um, uh, uh, and the other thing is blocks. Um, uh, we, we, you may have heard a lot about sort of talking about block detection. Um, that's where that's all set up. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Let's uh, let's just start with um, with accessories first. I think I've pressed the button. There we go. Um, now you've noticed that I've got a uh, I've got a bit of a layout here already um, on the map, uh, and this is listing all the accessories on that layout. Um, so uh, obviously I, I can edit them from here, but I, I can also edit them by editing the map, which is probably the, the better way of doing it. Um, but let's just start with one uh, in particular. Here we go. Point number one. And that is the uh, description, turning to stage yard descent. Um, so in fact, this is this one up here. Um, and uh, that's where uh, my, my train can come around and then take a point and take the, uh, the long, slow descent down to the lower level where the staging is. There you go. It's a turnout right. Um, it's, it's actually a curved, uh, it's a curved point, but uh, it uh, turns out right. Um, and there we go, initial state, so uh, how that is. And here we say, right, so this is the interface that the accessory is going to use to, um, uh, that's used to connect to that accessory. Um, and uh, a few other bits and bobs. Uh, here we go, activation time, that's how long it takes to switch. And then the address. Now, this is easy, it's just a single point. Um, so it's got a single address. There's, a, there's one point motor underneath that makes it happen. And that is address number one. Um, so accessory number one on the Digitrax DCS210 uh, interface is this point. That's what that's saying. Um, and down here, there's, there's various things we can do with it. So let's just have a look. Uh, state mapping. Right, so there we go. So if we want it straight, uh, that's uh, red, and if we want it branched, that's green. So that's that's to do with sort of which way around. And I think red and green you can use as a reference to your wiring. Um, state feedback. Now I don't think I'm using this. Um, well, it does say activated. Perhaps I should set to deactivated. I don't. I don't know about this, but I assume this is where you could have a point. Oh, you can have hardware where it, it measures whether, whether it's um, which state it's in, which way the point's switched, and feed that information back. Um, but I, I don't think it's really necessary because all you do is you just say, well, just set it the way I want it. And then if it's not that way, then it is after that. And you can just keep track of it. So I don't think that's 
um, terribly essential. Here we go, length and speed. So this is the, the length of the track, uh, you know, how long uh, the run is. And I think it, it probably means along the center line um, for each of the two routes. Um, now I get this information from uh, my track planning software. Um, but obviously the uh, iTrain needs to know how long each bit of track is. Um, and I think we can set there, we can, we can set speed restriction uh, on that piece of track as well. Um, so we can play around with that. What does that do? There we go. Uh, we, can, we can set different restrictions. Uh, it's got some options there. Gosh, spring talk, state fever. I don't know quite what all these mean, um, but I expect we can, we can play around with them a bit. Um, there's a relay there. I think you can configure some of these things up so that actually the, the accessory drives a relay and the relay or the, or the, um, uh, the signal drives a relay and the relay drives the, the actual accessory. Perhaps if you had something that took a lot of power, but I don't need to worry about that. I'm not using that myself. Um, there we go. A few other things. You know what these mean? Anyway, I'll get to it. Anyway, but that's, that's points. Um, and I've set some points up uh, just to show you uh, that it works. Let me, uh, here we go, on, on, my, on my map, if I try and change this uh, point, then uh, hopefully it'll, it'll switch. Um, now, it won't switch right now because it's not, not connected. Um, so to connect, uh, to actually get the thing to connect, I need to press the connect button. Go, and it doesn't work. Now the reason it doesn't work is I haven't plugged it in. So here's the end of the wire. Um, it plugs in just here. I don't know whether you can see that on the camera, um, but that's the uh, the USB um, connector on the fascia that I made. There's another video about that somewhere. So I'll just plug that into my laptop. And uh, hopefully now if I say connect, So there was a little beep. I don't know whether you heard it. Um, and, uh, and now I can see the track status light on my DigiTracks uh, logo that panel has come on. So now if I flip my uh, this point number one, I don't know whether you can hear that, but that is the sound of a tortoise point motor switching. So that's fantastic. Now, just while we're, we're looking at accessories, um, just here, there's a, um, a three-way point. Um, now, that's worth having a little play with um, because it's actually got two tortoise point motors. Um, if I go to the switchboard, I can edit this, uh, this, this map. There we go. Here's the switchboard editor. Um, I'm not going to get into this in detail. Um, but over here is my three-way point. If I right-click and go to properties, perhaps I double-click it. There we go. If I double-click it, I get the properties of it. Um, and here we have the state mapping. Um, well, first of all, let me show you uh, its address type. It says it's double. It's got two addresses. And that's because it's got two point motors. So here, um, one of the point motors is address 12, 11, and one is address 12. And here the state mapping um, says that if I want it straight, um, then I have uh, uh, it, it, um, point motor 11 set to green and point motor 12 set to red, and so on for the other options. Um, so that way I can... I can flip one. Uh, uh, let me, I can f I can flip uh, the three-way into one of the three states, and it's actually controlling two different point motors. Um, again, I don't know if you can hear it, but I'll I'll put some footage in later of it. Uh, these switching, so it goes to straight, and then the other way. Okay, so we've had a look at uh, accessories, so that's good. Um, 
Perhaps the next thing we'd like to do is to drive a locomotive around. Um, so if I go to edit and uh, choose locomotives, that will show me my list of locomotives. Um, now I've only got one in this list here down the side. Um, it's my Royal Scott uh, number 6100. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different stuff set up about uh, this, uh, this locomotive. So I told it it's a steam locomotive. I told it exactly how long it is. Um, that's sort of between the length, you know, between the couplings. Um, now, in, in general, the more information you you give iTrain and the more accurate that information, then uh, the more precise it can be about things. So that's good. Um, now here, the uh, decoder type, I've got this set to decoder 126. Uh, sorry, DCC 126. Um, there's several different uh, DCC decoder types. I, I got in a bit of a muddle over this, uh, setting this up. Um, but uh, essentially, that's the number of speed steps it's uh, it's got. So uh, when you set up your DCC decoder, you can normally configure them in various different ways. Um, and sort of older decoders uh, used to have a, a smaller number of speed steps and, and so on. Um, so you have to sort of play around with this. And if you get it wrong, you get in a bit of a muddle. Um, and you have to and you have to program some CVs to change it, the number of speed steps, all that stuff. Um, I don't want to get into that. Um, but I've had quite quite the adventure playing around with it. Um, but that's uh, that's where I've, I got to. And oh, I, I found I got much better results if I just set it to have 126 speed steps, or if it's, I mean, it's 128, but um, you know, one of them zero, and I don't know, there's another one that's not used, or something. I don't, don't quite know. Um, anyway, there we go. So that's how it's set. That's the address. It's got a four-digit address. Again, when you're programming your, when you're using your uh, decoder, you can either have a two-digit address or a four-digit address, and then you have to program a CV in order to switch it or something like that. Um, again, look at the manual for your uh, for your decoder and work out how to do your CVs. I'm not getting involved in that now. Um, but it's that address on, again, on the Digitrax controller. So that's all good. You can set a, uh, a custom image. Um, so uh, that's right. You just uh, take a picture and uh, upload it to the right, the right place. Um, here it's got, a, it's got a speed curve. Now we're going to come back to that later. So I won't say too much about that now. Um, various configurations and things uh, that I don't quite understand. Um, here are some options. It's engage, so that's all good. Um, polarity, so I think if you wired, it, wired your, your um, decoder in the wrong way around, you, you can just flip it there. Um, here you've got uh, inertial simulation, so you can uh, you can set it to slowly accelerate the locomotive and, and slow it down slowly. Um, now, it is possible to program a CV configuration value on your decoder to get it to do that. Um, but the recommendation is you, you don't use that. You set the, uh, the decoder to sort of not do inertial um, inertia, yeah, acceleration, deceleration. And instead, you let the, the software do it. Um, now, I imagine that means you're not going to get quite the same experience if you're controlling it by hand. Um, but anyway, there we go. I'm a beginner on this, so I don't, don't quite know. Um, ah, now, here we go. Feedback offsets. Um, now, this is where you see where on the locomotive um, the uh, feedback detection occurs. Um, and there's different types of uh, feedback you can have. There's occupancy detection, which is um, current sensing um, through the rails, and therefore the offset is going to be the position on the train where the first pickup, um, electrical pickup is, depending on which wheel it's on, because that's how far along the train has to move until it starts uh, being detected by the track. Um, and then there's uh, there's other types. There's read contact and light barrier. Um, now, if you've watch my channel before, you might know that I'm interested in optical detectors. 
And I think actually my type of op um, optical detector is, a, is a logically equivalent to a reed contact. Uh, a reed contact would be where you have a little magnet on the underneath and it goes over a, a reed switch. But that's, uh, that's producing a sort of creating a connection when the locomotive goes over, which is different to a light barrier. A light barrier would be where you're shining uh, a light across the track and then when the locomotive goes through, it breaks the beam. Um, which is the sort of the sort of negative, um, you know, it's it's normally on and when it's occupied, it's off. Um, but we'll we'll come back to that. That's uh, that's obviously something I'm interested in. Um, here we go. Permissions. Not quite sure about that. Um, and, and obviously a comment. Um, so I've I've put in my uh, I've put in my locomotive uh, and, and had a go uh, with that. So it's all set up. Which means if I come down here to locomotive uh, and I choose Royal Scott, now at the moment the trains over there somewhere, um, and that's shown on the uh, on the map here by this this track that's red um, because it's being detected by the, uh, the feedback detector. Um, I, I don't want to get into that now. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but what I can do is I can I can uh, drive the train manually uh, using this. So it's meant to go forwards. If I change it to backwards um, and turn it up, hopefully you can hear that there is a train running. Um, you might be able to see it as well. I'll set it to go a bit quicker. I think for some reason, it's trying to slow it down, I think. Ah, you know, I think I think what's happening there <laughs> is quite sweet. I think what's happening there is that it's uh, it wants to keep it within the block. Uh, I think that's why it stopped it. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep try and keep it going, uh, and you'll see now another piece of tracks become red. Um, it's it's what it's detected it in that block. Um, uh, and so it's moved it. You see here, it says the Royal Scot is now over here. Um, anyway, it's uh, it's whizzing its way along. Uh, I think it's going to probably try and stop it before it leaves this block now. I've not actually fiddled with it like this. There we go. It's uh, it stopped it just before it leaves that block. But I'm going to crack on. So come on, off we go. Um, and you'll see the trains now just here, locomotives just here. I expect it'll probably try and stop it in that block now. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. Now it did try and stop it just before it went onto the uh, thing, but you'll you'll see it's uh, both these tracks now are that one and that one are are red, so it's sort of bridging the bridging the uh, the gap. Anyway, so so that's how you you set a locomotive up, you give it a give it an address and so on, and then you can drive it uh, through the software. So that's that's what I want to show you there. Okay, so having driven uh, the trains around a little bit, um, there's one more thing that I need to talk to you all about, which is uh, feedbacks and blocks. Um, now I sort of alluded uh, to blocks a bit uh, as we were we were driving the trains around, um, and that was all lots of fun. Um, but perhaps before uh, before we get to blocks, I think it's probably best if I just talk uh, a bit about feedbacks, and then I can explain blocks uh, in the context of feedbacks. Um, so if we go and have a look at uh, our feedbacks, uh, feedback screen, so we're going to edit uh, feedbacks. Uh, here's a feed, the feedbacks editor. There's a list of feedbacks here. Um, and uh, let's just have a look at the first one on the list, which is number 18. Um, now, there are several different types of feedbacks that we can have uh, in iDrain. Um, the first and most obvious one is uh, a, an occupancy detector or a current sensor. Um, and that's the type of feedback that detects electrical current uh, running through uh, the rails when there's uh, a locomotive on, uh, on the track. 
Um, even if the locomotive's not going anywhere, there'll be some current being taken up by the DCC controller. No, the DCC decoder. Um, so, uh, so whenever there's a, a, a locomotive on that section of track, it can be detected um, by current passing uh, through the rails. Um, and that tells you that that length of track um, is occupied. There are also uh, several other types that will tell you when a train passes a particular point. Um, so there are um, uh, read, uh, read switches, read detectors, um, where you have a magnet underneath the uh, locomotive. And when that passes over a read switch, it's embedded in the track. Um, the, magnet, uh, the magnetic field will close the read switch, and so you get an electrical signal um, that locomotives passing that particular point in the track. Um, the, other, the other type is uh, a light barrier, where you have a light that shines across the track, and when the locomotive passes through, it breaks the beam of light, um, and that tells you that uh, the train's passing through at that particular point. Anyway, let's have a look at this feedback. Uh, so it's number 18. Um, here goes, it's got a name, uh, SY4FB1, so that means for me staging yard 4, uh, lane number 4, and uh, feedback 1. And it says here it's a current sensor for staging yard uh, lane number four. Um, this type drop down, uh, it's set to occupancy, but you can see it says uh, several other options, read contact, uh, light barrier, um, and there's several, several others as well, but uh, I'm not going to be, be using those. Uh, and we can, uh, we can say it's inverted or not. Um, so I suppose the idea is it's... Uh, you know, is it, if, if the electrical connection's there, does that mean it's occupied? And if the electrical connection's not, that means it means it's not. So depending on the type of hardware you've got and how it works, you might want to click the inverted button uh, to make it work the right way around. Now this one, because it's an occupancy detector, it's got a length. Um, as I explained, occupancy detection is, is about uh, detecting current passing through uh, the rails in the length of track. And so it's uh, the system needs to know how long that length of track is because you're not measuring uh, a train passing a particular point you're measuring a train being on a length of track uh, so that's the length uh, and here we, we set up the address so we've got say what the uh, the interface is uh, what, you know which controller you're talking about i've only got one um, and the address is number 18. Um, now, as I might have mentioned before in some of my videos, um, I'm using DigiKey's uh, feedback hardware, um, and uh, uh, they come in uh, um, they come in devices that have 16, 16 uh, feedback inputs. Um, so the first one starts at number one, address number one, and then they're daisy chained off there. Um, so the second one will start at seventeen. So uh, address number 18 is the second input on uh, uh, the second device I've got. And in fact, I know the second device is the one that does current detection on the uh, um, on the uh, baseboard uh, frame that I've got behind me, um, as opposed to the one here beside me, which is, uh, on which I've, I've got the first current detection uh, DigiKeys device. So there we go. So that's a uh, that's a, so a feedback uh, setup. We can have another look at another one if we look at uh, this one here, number 33. Um, and this is uh, SY4FB2, so uh, staging yard 4, feedback 2. And it says it's the first optical detector in staging yard uh, lane 4. Um, now, you may be aware, um, if you've seen some of my videos, that um, I'm interested in a slightly different type of optical detector. Um, it's not a light barrier where the the, uh, the beam of light gets uh, cut by the locomotive going past. Um, instead, it's an infrared light embedded in the sleepers uh, that shines upwards. And as the locomotive passes over, the infrared light is reflected off the bottom of the locomotive uh, and then picked up by an infrared photodiode. Um, which is also embedded in the sleepers. Um, so this is logically equivalent to a read contact. Um, uh, when the locomotive passes over, you get a positive signal, um, you know, that uh, 
detection has been made by the photodiode. Um, however, uh, it's, uh, it's obviously slightly different. Um, but I'm setting it up as a, uh, a read contact. Um, and you'll see this one. Because it's a read contact, it doesn't have a length. If I set it to occupancy, you see it's got a length. But if it's a read contact, there's no length. And that's because the photodiode is going to be embedded in the track at a particular point um, along the track. It doesn't have a length. So it doesn't tell me the train's somewhere along a length of track. It tells me the train is in that specific place. Again, it's set up uh, with an address. Um, it's, this one's address 33. Um, so my third feedback uh, device uh, along the daisy chain, which, whose address will start at number 33, um, is uh, for doing optical detection. So there we go. So that's, uh, that's how you set up uh, your, your various feedback uh, devices. Um, and uh, in a moment, I'll show you how, uh, how they work for blocks. So to, uh, to set up blocks then, uh, we need to go to edit the edit menu and somewhere here uh, towards the bottom it says blocks. Now in iTrain a, a block is uh, essentially a length of track uh, that's in between some points. Um, I'm tempted to say it's a sort of straight piece of track but it's not, it can obviously be a curved piece of track. Um, but the key point is it's in between point work, you can't have point work somewhere along the length of a block. Um, and that's the sort of mistake that I, I got into when I first started trying to lay out my blocks. I hadn't quite appreciated that subtlety. And within a block, you can have one or more feedback devices. Um, and uh, it's the, the presence of the feedback devices that sort of, sort of define the block in a way. Um, so here we've got uh, the block editor. Um, and let's look at the first one, because this is for staging yard lane number four, which uh, is the, where the feedbacks that we were talking about are going to be. So it says here it's name, staging yard four, SY4. Um, it's description, that's the parking space number four in staging yard. Uh, so that's what we'd expect. Um, now you can set the type of track. Uh, I've got free track, um, but uh, it can be several other things. Uh, it can be a station, um, you can have sidings, um, presumably sidings. Um, they have a buffer at one end, um, so that's sort of logically that's subtly different. Uh, and there's various other types, and they've all got particular features uh, that I don't know exactly what they all are, but we'll, we'll come to that one day. Um, and in particular, it's got a length. Um, you need to know the, uh, iTrain needs to know the length of the block, because as the train drives through the block, um, it knows the speed of the train, and it can therefore work out how far through the block it is depending on uh, what the length is. Here we've got some details uh, of the block. It, it's the end gauge. Um, it, uh, it has a preferred direction. Um, so you can set uh, different options for the direction within the block. You can say that trains can only go in one direction along that block, um, or they, they can go either, or you can set preferred direction where usually you go up on the up line, but if you really need to, you could go down it. Um, can set a slope that's not that's not actually used um, but the idea is that in future versions of, of iTrain that might be used um, <clears throat> to allow for the fact that trains might go a bit slower when they go uphill. Um, you can change the polarity here at the block it might be that you've, you've wired up your, your droppers the wrong way around and, and you could invert them there um, somehow uh, and there are various other options here and I don't know exactly what they all mean um, here you see that you can set the, the signals. Now your, uh, the way you lay out your blocks is, is sort of fundamental to how your signaling works. Um, the idea of signaling is that it prevents you having more than one train in a block at any one time. So if a block is occupied, um, then the signal on entry to that block will be read, um, saying uh, no one's allowed past until the train that's currently in the block is cleared. Um, obviously, signalling gets to be more complicated than that, um, but that's sort of the, 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 the way you define the blocks um, sort of is fundamental to the way in which you make your signalling work. Um, several other options uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about because I don't quite understand uh, how they work. Um, but in particular, 
uh, I can show you the next tab, which is the feedbacks. Now you'll see here uh, in this block, there's three different feedbacks. Um, this first one is the, uh, the occupancy uh, uh, feedback, um, and that has a length. Um, and you'll notice the length of that occupancy feedback is the same as the length of the block, because there's only one occupancy uh, feedback in that block. Um, so it takes up the whole takes up the whole block. And there are two others, which are um, these read contacts or these, these optical detectors, um, and they will be part way along the block. Um, and what I need to do, um, I haven't done yet, is to mark exactly where they are um, in the block. And I'll work that out uh, later when I come to start trying to use those. Um, here, direction previous and direction next. Um, you can set various options based on the direction that the train is traveling through the block. Um, direction previous means going backwards through the block against the preferred direction. Um, and obviously next is uh, traveling on to the next block. Um, you can see here we've got the use positions uh, option set. Um, and that allows the, uh, the system to try and work out where exactly within the block the train is at any one point. Um, and we can then set the position within the block where we want the train to start braking, start slowing down, um, and where exactly we want it to stop if it's not allowed to go on to the next block. And that's sort of marked in uh, your position uh, along, along the block, uh, how far along the track it is. Um, now, if we don't use positions, um, this is a, a sort of the older way of doing things, um, then you need a different way of telling it when the train has got to at uh, the point it needs to slow down and when it needs to start to stop. Um, when it needs to stop. Um, and so uh, you have a, a, an entry feedback. Um, so for us, that's the, the current sensor because as soon as it uh, enters the block, it'll start to, uh, it'll, uh, the it'll be detected by the occupancy detection. Um, and then I could use my two optical detectors, one for the break one for the stop. Um, so when it gets halfway along the, the block, it might start to slow down. And then when it gets towards the end, it might, it might break, it might actually stop. Um, but I'm going to be using, using positions because um, I think that's a better way of doing things. Um, several other options here. So you can, uh, you can set speed limits um, uh, for various situations as trains pass through the blocks. Um, and you can, you can have different speed directions and different uh, you know, going up and down uh, along the track. Um, obviously, room for a comment. So, uh, so that's that sort of blocks. Um, uh, it's important to get as much information as accurately you can, as accurately as you can, into your blocks. Um, in particular, the lengths of the blocks and the lengths of the occupancy feedbacks um, are important. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm building my track um, very trying to build it very precisely um, to the uh, computer um, generated uh, layout I'm using the track lane software um, so I can use the software to tell me how long each of the blocks are um, and as long as I've built it accurately to the software um, then uh, those will be those will be pretty accurate so what I'm going to do now uh, to give this a go um, you see here I've got uh, I've got my Royal Scott in the this first uh, block at the beginning of the run, which is just, just over here somewhere. I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder. There we go. Um, and I'm going to move this um, into this block, which is the sort of the descent down into, um, into the staging yard. Now, uh, just before I do that, um, let me just show you something about that, that block that it's going to. Um, so we looked at the we looked at SY4, which is the uh, block in, actually in the staging yard with two opt optical detectors. But if we have a look at B2, which is the uh, it says descent to the staging yard. Um, again, that's free track. Its length is 277 centimeters. Um, but if we look at the feedbacks, it's got two feedbacks. And they're both occupancy, occupancy detection feedbacks. One is uh, 
37 centimeters and the other is 49 and uh, uh, 39 centimeters. Um, and the second one, uh, it starts 237 centimeters along. So there's a, there's a long block and then there's a shorter one at the end. And as the train travels through the block, it'll first be detected by the first feedback and it'll then pass over the join and be detected by the second feedback. Um, and that's going to tell the system um, that it's got to that point. Um, and although the system will try and track the train, uh, the locomotive through the block, that'll be confirmed uh, when it passes into the second uh, feedback um, area. Again, it's important to get all those, uh, those things just right. Um, you can see here I'm saying uh, start braking um, uh, about one and a half meters along and stop 267 centimeters long, which is 10 centimeters from the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my train to drive into that block. Um, I'll set route at which point it'll start running. And what it'll hopefully do um, is get into that block and then stop exactly 10 centimeters from the end. Let's have a look. So it's uh, starting to move the speed up. You might be able to see the trains running. And it's now passed uh, into the next block. You'll see this, this block here has gone red. There's only one occupancy detector in it. Um, and so th that feedback here is, is now red. It's just approaching uh, the corner and it's now passed into the next uh, feedback uh, uh, length of track. Um, so it's in the next block. But you'll see it's, it's occupied there, but not here. It's starting to slow down. In a minute, it'll pass across the join. There we go, it's been detected in the next one. And it slowed it down and stopped. So the big question now is, is it exactly 10 centimetres from the end? So I've laid out a tape measure. You can see uh, the 10 centimetre point here is just uh, on the end of the block. This is where my insulated uh, rail joiners are that mark the, uh, the end of the block. And if I measure back 10 centimetres, you can see that almost exactly uh, lines up with the front of the buffers. Uh, I'm probably about three millimetres out, but that's not bad for a, a first start. I'll give it another go. I'll change the settings to get it to stop 20 centimetres from the end uh, and see, uh, see how well that works. So I'm pretty pleased with the progress I've made so far. I've managed to get iTrain going, get it connected up to my uh, layout and uh, get some of, the, some of the main sort of concepts working. Um, in particular, I've uh, managed to connect to and drive, drive a locomotive around. I can control the accessories uh, and I can uh, find out what state the feedbacks are in. Um, so that's pretty good. And I can use all that to even uh, drive a train around or get the computer to drive a train around and even stop it in a roundabout, the right sort of place. So I think I need to crack on now. And uh, the next video needs to be about using those infrared um, uh, feedback, uh, uh, optical uh, feedback detectors in order to try and control the train and stop it even more precisely. I hope you'll join me for that.